morning's gospel reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20. It is the very, very last bit of the gospel. And it appears each year in our schedule of readings, the Sunday after Easter. It follows the disciples in the day and the week following the crucifixion and resurrection, after the love and the blessing that we just witnessed of being served, they find themselves locked away in fear. So listen now to how this scripture speaks to you in this reading from the Gospel of John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the crowds, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord, and Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark on his side, I will not believe. <clears throat> A week later, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Here ends the reading. Will you pray with me? Holy God, Holy Christ, Holy Spirit, one. In these next few moments, break through all the walls that we have constructed, enter into our lives, and breathe us your peace. Breathe on us your peace that we might hear your words to us more clearly, that we might live more fully into the lives you are calling us to lead. Amen. I remember quite clearly the first thing I thought when I walked into the sanctuary as Anne was leading me around on a tour before my first interview here. Looking at the multitude of pews and the balconies and the bright light filtering through the windows and the bright colors, I thought to myself, this is a congregation that has known joy. I have to say, I actually feel fairly similar standing here before you now. However, it's the first time I climbed Mount Hunger. <laughs> it is a stunning new landscape. I look at the walls, the bricks outside, and wonder about the hands that placed them. I rest my notes on the imposing pulpit and wonder about the hands that first grasped its edges. I see the wooden pews and wonder about the hands that carved them, and all the weary bodies that have come and been given rest. I see the inscription here on the pulpit which says, We wish to see Jesus. And I think to myself, You don't want much, do you? <laughs> you certainly couldn't have called someone a little bit more timid. But isn't that the crux of it? From this day to day, all the way back to Thomas, we wish to see Jesus too. And then there's you all at my former congregation. I could close my eyes right now and tell you exactly who is sitting where right now as we speak. Over there you have the smilers, the faces you can always count on to give you encouragement. Just in front of them is, we'll call her Kim, 
The woman who is in her head clearly using her skills as a lawyer to argue with everything I say. <laughs> Over here is the confirmation and youth section where they think I don't know that they are playing tic-tac-toe. <laughs> and yet they know I don't mind because they seem to hear and absorb more than anyone else. Up front, you had the folks who looked like they were sweating because of the sermon, but really they were just too close to the wood stoves. <laughs> but here, up here, you stretch before me like the valley. What are your stories? Where are your locked rooms? What is the word of God meaning to say to you today? And who will be that voice for you? I imagine that you are wondering the same of me. What stories will I tell you? Can we trust you? Is there life enough in you to meet all of the life that is in us? Clearly, there is so much to be learned about each other in this place. So I'll start. And it seems like a funny place to start. But when I bought my first car, my first new car, the only criteria that I had that was a must-have was that it had a functioning door remote. <laughs> I had, of course, a long list of things I would enjoy in a car, mainly things that weren't working in my current car, like radio, air conditioner, windows. <laughs> but the selling point for me was really a remote. I told myself it was a safety issue. Late at night, walking to the car after work in Boston, I wanted to be able to get in my car quickly. If anyone ever followed me or came close and I felt uncomfortable, I didn't want to be stuck fumbling with my keys to try to get in. Now, I am not a paranoid person, but every once in a while, when it gets dark out and the shadows get playful, my imagination will run wild, and suddenly it is not God that I am trusting in, but a little black piece of plastic. I like to hear the door shut behind me, to hear the sounds of the outside world go mute, and hear that little click. The one that tells me that I am totally alone, and at least until I pull into traffic, I am in control. This morning, scripture tells us that on the evening of that first day, the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked. I can't picture the room. I don't know what it looked like, but I imagine it was quite plain. Thick slabs of stone patched together with clay and smaller stones, large enough to accommodate them all, with walls thick enough to absorb their whispers or their gossip and strong enough to help them feel secure in a time of insecurity. There must have been a simple locking device, probably reinforced with an extra piece of wood. Click. Now Thomas, I imagine him that first night afterwards lying in bed. He can hear the others down below murmuring and whispering in excitement. Having followed for so many years, having loved so unconditionally, he alone is the one who was not there. He alone must have felt not special enough to hear or to see or to touch. So maybe he stares at the crack in the wall, tracing it with his finger, imagining that he can hear it crack like his own heart. So maybe he cradles his head in his hands and whispers himself to sleep, saying, I will not believe. Click. We all have our walls. Those things that we have constructed to keep the world at bay, to make us feel in control or stave off uncertainty or fear or heartbreak or pain. I might not know where your walls are yet or what they are protecting, but I do know this. Like the disciples amidst the first of the Easter miracles, still we gather behind these walls because we know somewhere deep in our hearts that even something as solid as stone, especially something as solid as stone, can be rolled away. 
Some stones are built simply so God can roll them away. Some walls are built so God can walk through them. The story of Thomas is not about doubt so much as it is about God walking through whatever walls we have put up, whatever barriers to wholeness that we have created, looking us in the eye and not looking away and saying, peace. Peace be with you. As much as this is a story of Jesus' resurrection, it is also a story of our own. This is written so you might have life, it says. And when the disciples realize this, there are no walls that can contain them, no fear to hold them prisoner. Peter, whose lips only days ago carried denial, on this day carried prophecy. Thomas, whose lips carried doubt, on this day carried proclamation, my Lord and my God. Even Jesus, whose wounds once pronounced death, on this day proclaim victory, the reality of life. On the front page of the First Church website, you too proclaim that you welcome all and you find God. The strong walls, the intricate glass, the cut flowers, the sturdy pews, the balcony curve to turn your attention to one another, the soaring ceilings, this strong, demanding pulpit. What I see when I look around this room, strange and foreign as it still might be to me, is a place where everyone, everything, even the walls do not contain, but rather proclaim God. Intricately made by those first hands, reverently cherished by your hands, all of this proclaims the gospel of a living God. And so, brothers and sisters, like Thomas, all that is left for us to do is together touch and see. Thanks be to God.